If your God is either a liar or weak and you have to choose between those two things, then you're probably worshiping something that is not worthy of worship and probably isn't God. If a man-made book has far superior morality than your divinely revealed scripture, then I'm going to go ahead and just help you with your conclusion. Your book ain't from God. I don't know how to, like, this is such elementary level school um, ethics and morals that if you don't understand that it's wrong to have a slave, to have sex with your slave, and have sex with your married slave, I don't know how to have a conversation with you. Nah. Right. If you free the slave, he's adding this in, if you free the slave, um, would a free person want to stay married to their husband? Or would they want to divorce their husband and then marry <laughs> you? The one who, whom you, by the way, you were the one who went into their town, killed all of their relatives, took them captive, right? And then they're going to be like, oh yeah, I want to marry you instead of my husband. Uh, Swahili, I, I, I think you just need to think a little bit before you post those things. So feel free to retract your statement. Uh, clearly, it's uh, it's just, it's not, it's not good, buddy. Not a good statement. So we, well. oh, we do have our first comment from a Muslim here. Uh, Swati says, the title of this video is very strange. Both are prophets of God. There's no difference between Muhammad and Jesus. They preached morality come from God. That's a very interesting claim there, Swati, that there is no difference whatsoever in what they taught. Well, I'm, I, I would just like to point out to, what's his name, Swati or something? I, I, I would like to point out to you, uh, Mr. Muslim friend of ours, um, that there is actually a major difference in the teachings between the prophets, especially according to Islam. Now, when we look at the Islamic uh, teachings about Jesus, he is holy. He is the word of Allah. He and his mother both are the only two people in history, according to your Quran, that were never touched by Satan. They were completely perfect, sinless, and holy. Now, according to your own Islamic doctrines, especially in the Quran, uh, Muhammad committed sin. He had to have sin removed for him. He had to have sin um, forgiven of him for past, present, and future sins, right? So what we're noticing is that one of these people is sinful and one of these people is sinless. There's also a hadith that mentions that um, Muhammad would have to pray for forgiveness uh, 70 or 100 times every single day, right? So when we're, when we're talking about moral teachings, and we're going to get into this throughout the presentation, there's a lot of differences between the moral teachings of Jesus, especially in this first chapter on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and whatever it is that Muhammad said about his moral teachings. All right, so hopefully that covers it for a little bit of time. Uh, but thank you for stopping in, uh, Mr. Muslim friend. We appreciate you coming in and listening, and hopefully we can have um, some nice, uh, good interactive conversations as we go throughout the presentation. Absolutely. Uh, before you go on, uh, just to get him on topic, uh, before he said that, before he got off on that tangent, he was vaguely trying to be on topic, and he said that you, we don't, you don't have the teaching of Jesus. You are following Paul. Uh, I guess he means Paul. <laughs> Then I asked him, uh, "Well, if we don't have the teaching of Jesus, where do you find the teaching of Jesus?" And he says in the Quran. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm just going to briefly, briefly mention this to him. In Surah 6, 115, it says, no man can change Allah's words. So despite the fact that there are 15 at least mentions of the Quran coming to confirm Allah's words, and in Surah 3, 3, and in Surah 7, 157, it says that our book, the Injil, the Torah, the Zabur, is in between our hands, right? This is a location adverb, meaning that the true words of Allah in the Injil, Torah, and Zabur were with the people at the time of Muhammad. And then when we apply the no man can change Allah's words, and no Muslim can say that the Injil, the Torah, and the Zabur aren't, Allah's words, then anytime a Muslim says that our book or our scriptures is corrupted, basically what they're saying is Allah doesn't know what he's talking about. His promise to keep his word, he was fibbing, right? He was lying. Or on the other end of the spectrum, then he could be saying, oh, well, he, he wasn't lying. He's just 
too weak to actually prevent man from corrupting his words. No matter which way you look at it, buddy, uh, what you end up having to realize is that Allah is either a liar or he's weak. Okay, If your God is either a liar or weak and you have to choose between those two things, then you're probably worshiping something that is not worthy of worship and probably isn't God. All right. Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully that uh, that finishes up. comments that. from Swati. I don't think he's actually listening, so I'm about to ask him if he's listening and tell me what mm -hmm. I just said. Uh, but he says, no, brother, you're wrong. The Quran doesn't talk about the book which you have now. The Quran says the revelation which we, I guess that's supposed to say revealed therein. So if, let's go back to what you said at the very start. Let, where you mm -hmm. said, let's just, for the sake of argument, say yep. that the Bible yep. is corrupted and it's a man-made book. Good point. All right, buddy. So let's let's go ahead and do that. Okay. For, for the sake of argument, I don't believe this for a second, but for the sake of argument, let's go ahead and say the entire Bible is made up man-made man stuff. Okay. Let's go ahead and say that. The one that we are reading today, the one that's on the screen here, let's say, for the sake of your argument, that is man-made. Then, fine. Okay, compare your religious book and the moral teachings of your religion to that of the man-made Bible. And then tell me which is morally superior. If a man-made book has far superior morality than your divinely revealed scripture, then I'm going to go ahead and just help you with your conclusion. Your book ain't from God. <laughs> Your book is man-made, and it was man-made by someone who is a complete and utter depraved, morally depraved idiot. Okay. Uh, well, before you go on, uh, so, so he didn't actually prove that he, he was listening, um, but he did say, what a nonsense. This is adultery, and Islam is the biggest sin. Um, not quite sure what he's trying to say, but I think he's just trying to say adultery. Is well, he, but how he, is adultery defined? In yeah, he, I was going to say he has to redefine the word adultery, right? So when I've actually had conversations with devout Muslims on this topic, we will define we will define adultery in the same way until I bring this up, and they say, "Well, Allah said, right?" Because they follow divine command theory, Allah said this is not actually adultery, right? Um, but it is actually adultery because of this little word in there called except. Except. All married or except. Okay. When it says except, that means, well, they're in the same category, but it's okay for you. Right? So it's a, again, first and foremost, the Quran is commanding or saying that it is halal. It's okay for you to have captive slave women. First and foremost. That's something that you're going to have to get used to. And it says that not only can you have sex with them, right? Your captives, right? I would call this sex slavery. That even if their husband is still alive, it's not wrong for you to have sex with someone who is still married and their husband is still alive. I don't know how to, like, this is such elementary level school um, ethics and morals, that if you don't understand that it's wrong to have a slave, to have sex with your slave, and have sex with your married slave, I don't know how to have a conversation with you. And if you want to start objecting to it, I will kindly ask that he has to kick you out because you are just a troll at that point. Okay? Okay. Uh, he just posted a new comment, so because of the delay, he probably didn't hear what you just it's said. It's all right. He said, uh, do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Exactly. Indeed, it is, an, it is ever an immorality and it's evil as a way. What's the key word in that phrase there? Unlawful. And so we have to define unlawful. And the way that Muslims define unlawful is absurd. Okay, so we can talk about um, Surah 65 verse 4, right? Which gives you a prescription on a waiting period for divorcing a woman who has never had a period, I shouldn't even say woman, girl, who is too young for menstruation, okay? There's no need for a waiting period to divorce a female if you have not had sex with her. That's in, I think, 3310, don't quote me on that. But um, so what a law prescribes in 65.4 is the legality 
of having sex with and divorcing a prepubescent girl. So according to the Quran, according to all the tafsirs surrounding that, according to Muhammad marrying a prepubescent girl, having sex with her before her uh, period because she was still playing with dolls, that's lawful according to Islam. Right? You say lawful, everybody else says awful. It's disgusting. So again, if you don't understand morality, I don't know how to have a conversation with you. Right? They're, they're, we need to pray for you. We need to pray that the demons inside of your head that are telling you that these things are okay, despite you probably having an objection if this happened to your mother or your sister or your wife or your young child, you would have an objection to that, I bet. So why are you applying double standards? I have no idea. And just uh, one more comment on mm -hmm. this. Uh, he said, there's a law for this. You have to free the slave and then uh, make nikah with her. You are misunderstanding the teaching of the Quran. Uh, well, first of all, you need to cite as a source for your claim. But second of all, if if that if your what you claim is true, then apparently Muhammad and his men misunderstood the Quran and they mm -hmm. violated it on a regular basis. <laughs> so I, I don't think you're really helping your case here. No, and and he's going to redefine nikah as well. He's going to say, oh, it means marriage. No, it doesn't. It means sex. Okay, because there's a there's a um, hadith that talks about I don't know the word in Arabic, but the nikah of your hand. Okay, that's talking about masturbation is is do you marry your hand? No, it's only talking about not marrying them. It's talking about having sex with them, fornicating with them. Okay, this is this is the in the rest of the passage, uh, 424, talks about muta marriage, right? It talks about temporary marriage, which the Shia still follow because they don't follow um, the Sunni sources of, of Hadith. And even when you read the Sunni sources of Hadith, Muhammad himself did not say that this was unlawful. I think it was actually Abu Bakr or one of the caliphs that actually said that it was unlawful. Okay, so if the Quran is supposed to be superior to all the other teachings, then you should be allowed to do what the Shia do and have temporary marriages. Okay, not to mention the disgusting practice that I've already talked about when it comes to marrying children and divorcing children. Speaking of divorce, marriage in Islam. Did you have anything to say, Thaddeus? Yeah, well, I just want to add two things. Um, one, notice how he keeps referencing law. Well, he's actually correct here, in a sense, in that Islam is not based on morals. It's based on laws. Oh. You know, you follow the technical uh, specifications of the law and you're good to go. It doesn't matter what's in your heart. This is a key <laughs> difference between Christianity and Islam. Uh. Uh, or, you know, between what anyone who's not a Muslim would define as morality and how Muslims define morality. And then the other thing is he doesn't see the contradiction here. The Quran says that women who your right hand possesses are are exempt from this role. Well, mm -hmm. if you free the slave, then they're already then they're no longer a woman that your right hand possesses. So how exactly does the Quran make any sense then? Why did if Allah you, put this in there? Right. If you free the slave, he's adding this in. If you free the slave, um, would a free person want to stay married to their husband? Or would they want to divorce their husband and then marry <laughs> you? The one who, whom you, by the way, you were the one who went into their town, killed all of their relatives, took them captive, right? And then they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I want to marry you instead of my husband. No, they hate you. They should hate you for what you've done to them and to their people. All right. Yeah, and it's a contradiction. It doesn't even make sense. <sighs> Anyhow, marriage in right, Islam. Yeah. yeah. Allowing you to move on. Oh, oh, Swati says Allah swears the lesser things because there's nothing greater than him and people swear by the greater thing. D do you did you think about this statement before you wrote it? You just admit Allah swears by lesser things. Why? He can't he, Give him a why, chance why does to... he need, First of all, why does he need to swear by anything? Why can't he just say something and have it actually be meaningful? Why do right. people have to have him swear if, if he's good and he's always telling the truth he shouldn't need to swear by anything first of exactly all. and second of all why does he choose to swear by lesser things why doesn't he swear by his own uh justice or or swear by his own mercy or swear by 
something, you know, he's got 99 names. He, he can swear by any of those 99 names, but instead he swears by he swears the stars. By fig tree, fig tree and olives. That's, that's, that's pretty low, man. That's pretty low. Um, yeah, Swahili, I, I, I think you just need to think a little bit before you post those things. So feel free to retract your statement. Uh, clearly it's, uh, it's just, it's not, it's not good, buddy. Not Challenge good. to any Muslim, prove you're morally worse than Muhammad because Muhammad's supposed to be your perfect example. That means you got to be worse than him, right? Safras, maybe you can help us out. Maybe you can tell us how you are morally inferior to Muhammad in any way whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. What, what sins have you committed that are greater than the sins of Muhammad? Like you have to honestly, throughout the world history, it's difficult to find someone who committed more heinous sins like than Muhammad did. It's actually difficult to do so. And you could probably make an argument that Muhammad was perhaps one of the worst sinners, if not the worst sinner of all time. But who knows? Who knows? Absolutely. So we'll give a couple minutes here for Safraz to wake up and realize that He's in a, a chat with a specific topic and he's just spamming random things. Oh, but he did just tell us that Prophet Muhammad was sinless. So maybe he is getting up to speed here. Okay. Uh, so Safraz, Muhammad was sinless. Interesting. Why does the Quran tell him repeatedly to confess his sins? Hmm. Why does Muhammad himself in the Hadith say he confessed his sins and ask for forgiveness 70 times a day in one hadith, 100 times a day in a different hadith. Are you telling us that you know Muhammad better than he knew himself? Are better you telling us you know Muhammad better than the Quran, better than Allah? No, because most Muslims are married to their idea of how God should be and how a prophet should be. And so through that biased lens, they only see what they think it should be as opposed to what it actually is. So wake up. You're following a false religion, a false doctrine, full of evil and hateful things. Uh, Wooter left a super chat. No comment, just a, a donation. Thank you very much. And a cool picture, though. I don't know if you can zoom in on his picture. Um, uh, it's pretty, I can't pretty funny. It looks like Muhammad with a sword against a smurf. <laughs> Papa Smurf. <laughs> yeah, if, if you leave us a, a link to that picture, I, I can put a. That's I awesome. Can call it up. Yep. Uh, Safra says that he was humble. He was teaching his followers how to repent to God. What? Please, should I? Do we need to call up the actual words of this hadith? It's okay, not, but and, and at the same time, at the same time. Being humble is fine. I have, no, I have no issue with someone being humble. What I have an issue with is someone being a liar. Okay? Because you're saying, oh, he was humble. He was just teaching his followers how to repent to God. But if he's asking for repentance and he had no repentance to be asked for, that would make him a liar. So which is it? Sassafras? Is he, is he humble because he sinned? Or is he a liar because he didn't sin and he asked for forgiveness anyway? Your choice. I'm going to go ahead and share one of the Hadith here. Uh, narrated Abu Hurairah. I heard Muhammad, or I heard Allah's messenger saying, by Allah, I asked for forgiveness from Allah and turned to him in repentance more than 70 times a day. I don't see anything about teaching there. And in fact, all I hear is that someone overheard Muhammad saying this. Hmm. Very strange. Sahih Bukhari, right? So it's super Daif. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Daif Bukhari here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's, it's illogical. So as a Muslim, if, if you want to remain a Muslim, just say, yes, Muhammad's like any other man. He had sins. He uh, asked for forgiveness, right? But if you're going to hold to the position that he was sinless, and he's asking for forgiveness, he's either lying or you have no idea what you're talking about. So try to be consistent with your reasoning here, guys. And, uh, you know, I'm going to point out again that this is also in the Quran, Allah's words. So are you, you now saying that Allah is Muhammad? Because your excuse is that he was humble. 
was Allah also humble on behalf of Muhammad or something? Because in the Quran, it repeatedly says, Muhammad, turn from your sins and come back to me. Mm -hmm. Yep. It always makes sense when you don't think about it, guys. So go ahead and just not think about it and it'll all make sense. Okay? Okay. Uh, LMCI says, Safraz, you're being a good follower of Muhammad by lying. Excellent job. <laughs> now, this, this is what we see, that the only way to defend Muhammad is, is to lie and not think about what you're saying and say contradictory things and think that the, there's no problem. I mean, ha have you ever heard a good argument of any kind for Islam? Uh, not an honest one, no. Not an honestly good argument. Their, 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 best, their best argument is to try to disprove Christianity. That's why they typically don't even like to defend Islam. Their best argument is to cur try to create a false dichotomy. Either you're a Muslim or you're a Christian. So we'll just eliminate the Christian idea so that you'll have to automatically become Muslim. Uh, that's stupid, by the way. There are plenty of other ideologies out there that one would follow. And I think Islam would be the very last one that I would ever pick based on the research that I've done into Islam. It's a detestable, backwards religion. Uh, Safraz has just proved my point without realizing it about how they'll say contradictory things and not realize there's a problem. Because now, now he's dropping the idea that Muhammad's sinless and he's saying many prophets sinned in the Bible. Does that make them false prophets? No. Uh, I, no. I know Safras hasn't been here for the last 92 minutes, but do you recall us ever saying Muhammad was a false prophet because he sinned. No, that was never that was never the claim. Yeah, uh, we're, we're talking about the morality he taught. We're not mm -hmm. even talking about what he did as a person. But here's here. Here's the difference, Thaddeus. Um, we, we can actually attack Muhammad's morality for one reason, right? Not to say because he's a false prophet, but because the Quran says that he is the best example for mankind. He is the pattern of conduct for all mankind, right? But he has to repent for sins. He has to, you know, he, he asks for, he clearly sins throughout the Hadith. Like if there's no, he's disgusting. He, you know, he had sex with a, a nine-year-old girl. Um, he's a disgusting person. In the Quran, there's actually a way better person because every person in the history of people was touched by Satan before they were born or while when they were born, except for two, two people, Mary, the mother of Jesus and Jesus himself. Nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in the Bible, would you read about Jesus doing something and be like, oh, I'm embarrassed by this. Let me have to make up some stupid excuse for him. No, he, Jesus is the perfect moral example for mankind. So if I make the claim Jesus is the more perfect moral example for mankind, and then you read about him sinning, you can attack my position. If your position is Muhammad is the perfect moral example for mankind, and two things, I can find someone better than him, which you are probably included in that list, Sassafras, and Jesus is a perfect moral example, right? And Muhammad had to repent for all of his sins, okay? So I can't attack your position because that is your position, right? We don't hold that all the prophets were sinless. We don't hold to that position, all right? We hold to the position of the prescriptions of God and what he told his prophets to do are perfect, not the descriptions of what the prophets did. Muslims have a very difficult time understanding the difference between prescription, something that we're commanded to do, and description, something that happened. Okay? A lot of times when someone does a mistake, it's written in the Bible so that we can learn from their mistake and not make the same mistake ourselves. Absolutely. So Safra's again changing tactics here. Now he says Jesus was not moral. He called non-Jews dogs and pigs. Did he? Or did they call themselves that? <laughs> Yeah, Safraz, you, you don't have the slightest clue about how to actually properly read the Bible. Mm -hmm. it, it, why don't you do yourself a favor and go and read that whole story? Mm -hmm. Not just some Muslim website taking two words out of context, 
go and read the whole story and see what actually happens uh, when Jesus calls a, a Gentile woman, or not actually calls her, but uses the word dog while mm -hmm. talking to a Gentile woman. Mm -hmm. and, and understand also do yourself some favor a favor and and go ahead and look at the greek because as we know you can't understand a scripture unless you, you look at the original language and you're going to find that the word used for dog in that passage is in fact not a derogatory term uh, but it's a term of endearment like a pet dog mm -hmm. yeah and understand imagery too uh jesus speaks in parables all the time a lot of his teachings are both to be understood in the words that he said and from the from the actions that he took they're both parabolic um, speeches and parabolic types of action so you can actually learn a lot if you pull your head out of your rump so that'll be good for you prophet isa says dynamic kuznik i don't know if you can see that create bird then bird of Isa poop on Kaaba. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Swati's over here trying to claim that the, the various lines of the of Hebrews or Matthew or Psalm 91 say that Jesus was not crucified. Okay, That's yes, it. pull that up. I love, this is my favorite argument. One well, of my favorite okay, which arguments. Which one do you want to do? You wanna do the Psalm 91. Oh, Psalm 91, all right, yeah. we'll do Psalm 91. Swahidi, I, I would like to then let me pull up the text. Yeah, as well. I would I would like to thank you, Swahidi Dawa, for putting it on the tee for us. Um, so far, it's this has been very fun and easy. It's a good warm up. Um, here, here's the deal, buddy. Um, when the Holy Spirit leads Jesus out into the wilderness, where Satan he meets Satan, and Satan pulls Jesus up to the Temple Mount, right, and says, "Jump off, for it is written." And he quotes Psalm 91, that the angels will not let you strike your foot against the stone. So let's go ahead and think about this for one second. Do you think Satan in this story is properly representing the scriptures? Okay, no, Satan is not properly representing the scripture because he is the father of lies, kind of like a law is the best of deceivers. Synonymous descriptions, perhaps they're synonymous people. My point, if, and Jesus, by the way, refutes him by saying, I am God. He says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Saying, I am God is what Jesus is saying. Do not put me to the test. That is how Satan was misrepresenting scripture. And yet here you are trying to take sides with Satan in this argument. I believe in what Satan said, therefore Jesus was not crucified. I believe in that Peter, whom Jesus called Satan after he said it, who said, far be it from you, Lord, your death shall never happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Please keep putting these things up on a tee for us so that we can continue to expose how satanic your religion is. This is ridiculous. Goodbye, Mr. Sanchez or Swahidi. I can't remember who's who. 